right. Yeah, so I'm still in the car. Um, thank you for sticking around. This is the third and last part of the lecture. Um, if you haven't seen the second part, this is a continuation of that. So you might want to watch the last minute or two of that just to, to get the flow right. All right. Thank you. Have a good one. If the G tilde turn curvature vanishes, this term vanishes. Something similar can be said down here. This term vanishes, this term vanishes, this term vanishes, and we're just left with these fortunately signed terms. Um, this shouldn't be an N, this should be a nabla. That's my bad, that's a typo. Okay, and you get that the heat operator on trace GG tilde and the heat operator on norm epsilon squared, they're signed, which is super convenient for us. From there, right, from these a priori estimates, we can actually prove existence and convergence on bismuth flat manifolds, right? So given a compact bismuth flat Hermitian manifold and omega naught defining the same holomorphic vector bundle as a current algebraid, the solution to pluri closed flow with that initial metric has to exist for all time and it has to converge to a bismuth flat metric. All right, so bismuth flat existence and convergence. All right, so omega f is our bismuth flat metric. QF will be our background holomorphic current algebraid, and GF is going to be our usual untwisted metric. Then because omega naught and omega f have co-homologous torsion classes, we know that there has to exist a beta knot in wedge 2,0m such that del bar beta knot is del omega f minus del omega naught. Right? This is just kind of saying that beta naught defines the isomorphism between the two. Uh, holomorphic orthogonal bundles. And from this, we have enough data to define this guy. Right? This is a metric on the background holomorphic current algebraid. Uh, sorry, on the holomorphic current algebraid I del omega naught, the initial current algebraid and then we pull it back to the flat one, the background. So by a result of streets and Tien, we know that pluriclosed flow is parabolic and has short time existence. Um, in other words, there's omega t, beta t, and a positive real number epsilon, such that omega t, beta t solves pluriclosed flow on zero to epsilon. All this really means is that the only thing we have to do is, um, is establish a priori estimates, right? All we have to do is establish uh, long time existence and convergence. 
We can do that by a priori estimates. So, right? So by bismuth's identity, since omega f is bismuth flat, gf has to be churn flat. Which is really handy for us um, because this implies that our heat equations become very simple. Sorry, I guess this should be GF. Huh? How do I want to write this? G. GF is non-positive, and GC epsilon squared measured in the uh, evolving metric is also non-positive. Now, why is this beneficial? Well, first off, uh, because of, let me call this guy red star, because of that, we get that this quantity is not increasing. So in fact, we have that the supremum over m at time zero of trace g, g f is bigger than the supremum m up to time uh, t, trace g trace g g f. And this is uh, provided, right, provided the solution smoothly on this time interval. Right? But a small algebraic fact gives us that these two quantities are actually the same, right? These two traces are the same for generalized metrics, generalized Hermitian metrics. So these two traces, uh, they're not always the same, but at least for generalized Hermitian metrics, they're, they're identical. And putting all that together, we end up being able to find that there exists lambda, a uniform constant, so that lambda inverse gf is no bigger than g, is no bigger than lambda gf. All right. And then we can combine with that um, what I'll call green star. Right? Green star is going to behave similarly. Right? With green star, we're also going to have this zero. Upsilon squared is bigger than soup m zero to t uh, norm upsilon squared. And these are, in some sense, like L infinity and C1 estimates. Okay. So we know that nothing's blowing up.
But something that's even better is that we can bootstrap these. Right, so, so I guess I should just say, um, these are, in some sense, L infinity and C1 estimates for G and thus um, omega and beta. But these are actually bootstrappable. Um, all you really have to do is consider right, these can be put together to obtain smoothing. Just consider the function, I'll call it phi. T norm epsilon squared A trace G G F yeah. There actually exists an A which is sufficiently large and uniform such that this guy has a non-positive heat operator, which ends up yielding that the supremum m at time t of norm epsilon squared is controlled by a over t times the, the trace. All right. So this implies that we can bootstrap. We can bootstrap now. By a shatter theory. to get C infinity estimates on G, which implies estimates on omega and beta. All right. This then implies long time existence. This implies long time existence. Because if we didn't have long time existence, something would have to be breaking down. Right, we would have to be losing C infinity. So some estimate would have to be blowing up, uh, but these are these estimates are uniform. So there can't be any blowing up. To see the convergence part, uh, is a little bit different. But it is pretty standard as far as PDE arguments go. We want to take TJ, a sequence of times going to infinity. Then by our uh, CK estimates for every K, there has to exist a subsequence. G, T, J, K. Um, but I'll just abuse notation a little bit, drop the k's. Subsequence, which converges to a limiting metric, which converges to a smooth limit. G infinity, um, this is just by Ascoli Arzola. Ascoli. Arzola, because we have CK estimates for every K. So we can just use standard estimates to make sure that everything is smooth. Or standard, standard tricks, right? Um, and the fact that they're uniform, we actually get that this quantity 
right here needs to go to zero. But it also needs to converge. Sorry, uh, that shouldn't be G infinity. That's the punchline. Should be G F. But it also needs to go to G infinity G F because of our smoothness estimates, right? So we know that G infinity and GF have to have the same connection. So G infinity must be flat, must be churn flat. Now, we have a, a subsequence of times converging to G infinity. We need to really check that all the times converge there. And to do that, um, we swap flat backgrounds, right? So since the important part of GF is that it's churn flat, a churn flat generalized metric, but is that it's a churn flat generalized metric on Q, we can swap it for G infinity. Okay, and I'll, all our a priori estimates still hold. Okay, so in particular, if t is a large time with the property that the time evolving metric and g infinity are close, then we have to have that the, uh, the traces are close as well. Two n plus c epsilon, where c is uniform, and this has to be preserved for all times. This must be preserved for all times greater than t as well, just by our our a priori estimates, by our evolution equations, I guess I should say. This implies that GT this implies that GT converges to G infinity as the time goes to infinity smoothly. Our next result is on the moduli space of generalized Kähler structures on bismuth flat backgrounds. Um, so I'll define some of these things here in a second. Um, but generalized Kähler Ricci flow, it's uh, basically pluricloze flow with extra data on a specific kind of background. And by our prior work, Uh, that should say generalized. This should say generalized Kähler Ricci flow. So on a bismuth flat Hermitian manifold, given uh, an initial metric on the same current algebraid, holomorphic current algebraid, then the solution to generalized Kähler Ricci flow um, exists from zero to infinity and converges to a bismuth flat structure. Uh, in particular, I is biholomorphic to a complex structure um, with a bismuth flat metric.
So in fact, would you put it? So let's go ahead. I'll give some quick definitions, um, and then I'll give the proof. So the first definition is what is generalized scalar? So manifold um, mg ij Hermitian metric g is Hermitian metric i and j are complex structures is called generalized Kähler or a lot of times it's denoted gk if the j complex differential of omega j, right, this is gj, is equal to minus di c omega i, right, this is g i, we call that h, and we want h to be closed. Right? This is a generalized Kähler manifold. It's by Hermitian, right? By Hermitian metric with this kind of integrability condition. Then generalized Kähler Ricci flow is uh, right, G beta I on MJ. is said to solve generalized Kähler Ricci flow provided right beta is a J to zero form Right, I is a complex structure. G is a J Hermitian metric. And we have that del omega J dt is minus rho B to zero J, right? It's the J to zero part of the omega J bismuth curvature. And beta, sorry, this should be the one one part. I'm a little flustered, there's a lot of traffic today. <laughs> beta evolves by the two zero part, and the complex structure, I, evolves by uh, a Lie derivative term. Right, and the Lie derivative is in the direction of the difference of these, these Lie form things. So just to clarify, the way these are defined is that theta i is i d star omega i and theta j is j d star omega j. Um, these show up all the time when you're doing Hermitian geometry. Um, and especially uh, the non kähler stuff. So now we can move on to the proof really quickly. The proof really just relies on our prior theory. So omega fj this is a bismuth flat manifold then we can define uh, initial data. So we want I0 to be a complex structure defining a GK structure on uh, M omega F J. We also want to pick an initial metric 
right? A J Hermitian metric. Omega naught J. On the same holomorphic current algebra as our bismuth flat metric. Now, by our prior theory, oh, I'm sorry, I guess I should say, um, because these guys are on the same holomorphic current algebra, there exists a beta j not in wedge 2,0 for standard cohomological reasons, such that del bar beta j not is del omega f minus del omega naught j. All right. And then by our pluriclosed flow theory, we get long time existence and convergence to a bismuth flat metric. Right? So we know that this guy um, exists for all time. And uh, G omega Tj, beta Tj, converges converges to a churn flat generalized metric. Right, which is also saying that we get a bismuth flat metric downstairs and, and all of this jazz. And I guess let me call that J, just to throw as many J's on things as possible. Well, the thing we know is that uh, we can rewrite the evolution for I. in terms of the J bismuth curvature and sigma, right? They're contracted together. Where sigma is this commutator of the complex structures. <clears throat> but because all of this is determined, right? Since GT is converging, our coefficients are stabilizing, and our I's must converge as well. Our IT's must also converge. Converge smoothly to an I infinity. And this I infinity, we have estimates for, um, just as we've had estimates for everything else. Now, um, because IT, right, since IT evolves by a Lie derivative term, sorry, L I E, evolves by a Lie derivative term. We know there have to be diffeomorphisms. Right, IT is the phi T pullback of I naught. So all our estimates for IT become estimates for phi t. Right, so we have these smooth diffeomorphisms and they have to converge. Right, these must then converge for the usual reasons to phi infinity 
right? A diffeomorphism, a diffeo, such that I infinity is the pullback of I naught. Um, so it's got to be biholomorphic, right? So phi infinity is a biholomorphism. And these two complex structures are biholomorphic. And we've got, right, g infinity corresponds to a little g infinity in the normal way, which is uh, bismuth flat. Okay? So this is the contractibility of the space of generalized Taylor structures, which we, which we mentioned. Right. It's one of the ones I think is most interesting. So M4j, we want that to be a minimal non kahler complex hypersurface of non-negative Kodaira dimension. Then, again, if we put a pluriclosed metric on that, the solution to pluriclosed flow exists on 0 to infinity. This is... This is a little technical because it involves some machinery going through principal torus bundles. Um, because all of these kinds of manifolds are covered by principal torus bundles. And uh, you really just have to do the analysis there, apply the a priori estimates carefully, and you get the result. All right? So that's everything I have to talk to you about today. Um, I look forward to hearing your questions, and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you, and have a good one. Oh, and also thanks to Hoju for letting me speak at, at this conference. It's been a blast, and I've really loved working on this talk. Thank you. <laughs>